Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from Pulse Academia and Industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. Hello, Nick. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Such an honor to have you. Th- thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. So I would like to ask you first how you would like to define yourself for the audience who may be first time listening to you. Yeah, d- define myself sounds so broad and all-encompassing. And in another context, uh, I'd be a, a father, a husband, a maker, a, an athlete, uh, a Vermonter. Uh, but in this context, uh, I'm uh, Nick Cheney. I'm an assistant professor of computer science and at the University of Vermont and a faculty in complex and data science here. Um, I'm interested in, in machine learning, uh, especially systems that, that learn how to learn. Um, so in, in combination with, with a longstanding interest in embodied intelligence and in the relationship between structure and function, uh, a lot of my work and my lab's work is understanding uh, how the optimization of structure and function uh, allow the, the other to happen and, and vice versa, how you can find structures that allow for complex functions and how you can find uh, uh, controllers that allow you to create complex structures. So we ask each guest about their childhood. I'm curious about your childhood. And I, I saw also you do photography. I, it's really fascinating to see that this also has a, a side of your research. But if you tell us about your childhood, because you have this, all this talent and passion for science as you do so how was your childhood was? Do you have any memories about your childhood? Yeah, my, my childhood was was fantastic and a lot of fun. And, and I've uh, been lucky in, in so many ways throughout my life. But, but one of the best was just uh, to, to be, you know, born where and when I was to, to you know, a very supportive and encouraging family. Um, and, and I don't... Uh, you know, have stories uh, like like some of the others of coming from a, a research family or, you know, doing robotics and engineering when I was a, a little kid, but uh, had a, a family and, and parents who supported just kind of general curiosity and and, and having a wide range of interests. And I think that, that that's shaped uh, a, a lot of me and, and kind of the way that I approach my work with just a, an abundance of curiosity for, for all sorts of different things. Um, the, the maybe closest I can come to the, the prototypical story of, um, you know, doing robotics as a kid was, was I, I remember, um, the old appliances at my house, my parents used to let me take them apart and try and put them back together after they broke before, uh, we, we threw them out in the trash. Um, so not, not quite building robots, but, uh, one step in that direction, maybe. Great, great. So I'm curious that's cute for your work, Nick, because you have a lot of interesting uh, approaches in your work. But before that, what could be something for you when you look to the evolution and when you, I saw your picture, it's very inspiring when you see the nature and evolution. And most of your work already, ins- you have a lot of inspiration, but what's something maybe, I don't know, maybe first maybe something you couldn't understand yet when I, you try to see what we have in evolution and we tr- what we try to design, what really makes you inspired so you can also work in your work? I, th- I think there's correlation here between what you do in photography and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but... It's certainly, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly inspired by nature and, and you're right that one of my uh, many hobbies is, is trying to be out in nature and, and observing just how beautiful it is. Um, and, uh, and, and I think evolution and, um, and machine learning play together really nicely and, and it's something I, I got really fascinated in. Um, thinking about kind of not just all of the uh, amazing beauty and and function and specialization to different tasks and environments that that you see in in biological creatures, but um, being someone interested in in how things come to be and and how they learn and develop. The the idea of of evolution and and evolutionary robotics is that, that we're not necessarily focusing on biomimicry of a single species or animal or, or um, function, but it's trying to understand the process of, 
of how these complex phenomena could come to be in, in any given abstract scenario. And I, I think for me, that's, that's really appealing um, to, to try and understand how things came about and, and not just how they are, even though you know, that uh, could be uh, many, many entire careers um, just looking at the things around us. Um, uh, a related but, but kind of different perspective. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So related to this part, I'm curious to ask you, since you try to understand how these things work, one of the questions we always ask in, about embodied intelligence or maybe how, how you get inspiration, for example, you mentioned by Macri or by Bio-inspired, and since we know all the design may be adaptable, but when it comes to robotics, how, how you figure out something maybe beyond what we have in nature, because we know we have this certain fitnesses and certain environment, and we can't evolve simply everything that can reduce the fitness. So when it comes to robotics, do you think we can uh, pass what we have already in evolution and how we can do that? Yeah, it's, it's certainly our goal to take what's uh, amazing and inspiring in, in natural systems and evolutionary systems and, and bring them into robotics. Um, it's, it's also a really hard thing to do because I think that we have a very naive understanding of many of these biological systems and, and biological phenomena. So uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, that we're you know, actually duplicating or, or mimicking uh, these, these biological systems with any degree of confidence or certainty, but, but we're trying to move in that direction. Um, and, and certainly you mentioned adaptability, that, that that's, I think, one of the, the core things that, that I think is, is so interesting in biological systems is, is how they're uh, adaptive in, in so many different scales um, that, that, that you, you know you have uh, evolution on, on really long time scales and, and development kind of both mentally and physically throughout lifetimes and, and learning in the here and now. Um, and I, I think that, that that framework of building things that are uh, kind of robust and, and resilient and, and scalable, and, but especially adaptable um, at, at all sorts of timescales is, is one of the, the great lessons in biology. Um, just being able to, to pay attention to, to your surroundings and, and yourself um, and, and use that as a, a scaffold to uh, build the complexity that, that you need for any given task. Can you give us an example, Nick, about something maybe in nature or evolution for you hard to understand, you, you, you can figure out. And for you, for, if you're listening, what are the approaches do you think, the first thing you have to consider so that you can maybe have some uh, sort of understanding how the system is working and what could be beneficial to be inspired in your design? Yeah, uh, again, uh, there's, there's so much we don't understand um, uh, about nature. It, I, did, I don't even know where to start. Um, maybe one of the, the, the things that's so fundamental to a lot of the evolutionary computation work um, is, is just even how you represent uh, some complex structure or phenomenon in a, a set of amino acids, how, how you write down the blueprints to what makes um, something as, as complex as, you know, your and I behavior or, or the way that we look or the, or the way that we um, go about doing anything in the world around us. Um, and, and it turns out that to optimize structure and function to, uh, to, to be adaptable and, uh, and efficient and effective, that understanding that relationship of um, how, how you go from your genetic encoding from your blueprint into to your, your phenotype or, or how you actually uh, are instantiated and, and interact with the world is, is such a complex um, complex phenomenon that, that we have uh, some ideas of how that works in biology even without a full understanding um, and, and are you know, even much further away in, in our computational work too. So when it comes to robotics, one of the questions we ask when it comes to intelligence, should we invest more in the brain or, or the body or both of them? And since we aspire that we go to open-ended environment, we don't know anything, how do you imagine this kind of evolving the brain and the body? Should be only the body but sometimes like we have examples in nature that like the dead fish swimming upstream, having all this functionality for free, or maybe both of them. How do you envision that uh, embodied intelligence concept for soft robotics at open-ended environment? 
Yeah, that that's a, a great question, and and I one of the things I love about our field is that we kind of blur the line quite a bit between the the intelligence of of the body and the brain, um, and and both are, are certainly important. Um, the the example you know you give of totally passive um, behavior just from the the way that the, the fish is is shaped um, is a great example of some. Kind of you know very immediate low level physical interaction with the world which which seems like something that that is um, really well suited for uh, a really well designed body and, and form and, and at the other end of the spectrum you can think of kind of very abstract reasoning or, or long-term planning that that just seem like very um very cognitive abstract um Kind of what what you would think of as as uh, traditionally you know human level or or higher intelligent uh, behavior, um, that that is is certainly influenced in, in many ways by the body, but that seems like something that's that's more apt to the brain, and and kind of throughout the spectrum there there are interactions of, of both of those these pieces, um, that, uh, that that I think. I, I think mean for the interesting questions that we have in uh, things like autonomous robotics that that you really need pieces of both and and you can come up with really excellent demos or or uh, or, or kind of particular examples if you just look at the body or the brain um, but but I think you know really uh, autonomous and, and generalizable behavior uh, especially. Uh, as it deals with moving around the world or, or interacting with the world in any way, which is, is most complex tasks um, that, that it, you really can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, I'm curious to ask you because we have also some uh, guests in the podcast and they say, one of them say that maybe the intelligence or maybe con consciousness is not related to the brain or the body, maybe something else. Do you agree with that? Do you think when it comes to robotics, Maybe it's something not related to we have like this kind of sense of self or, or intelligence. Do you think it's beyond the brain and the body or does it make sense to you uh, when it comes to robotics? Yeah, I, I guess it, th this discussion gets philosophical very quickly uh, about how exactly you define the brain or the body or intelligence or consciousness. And, and I can imagine different definitions of each of those, which, which would lead to different answers. Um, if, if we're thinking of the, the consciousness kind of in, in the way uh, you and I think about uh, consciousness of, of kind of the, the story that we, we tell ourselves or, or how we feel uh, as we interact with the world, um, I, I think that is, is something um, that is, I, I, I would imagine that that's something that occurs in the brain just because I, I can't think of any anywhere else where where that would happen but but it's it's not um the the kind of kind of classical robotic control that you would think about um in in terms of you know you you get some sensory information and you process it to, to do some motor output um but but feels to me um and and i i, I should say i'm certainly not a a cognitive scientist or, or neuroscientist, even though I, I'd like to, uh, to to think about those things sometimes. But uh, to, to me, this, this, uh, the evidence seems like this is very much a, a story and a narrative that, that we tell ourselves kind of over the top of that, that basic brain-body interaction. Um, and, and so in that sense, I, I totally could see how, how it's something outside of what we would typically think about as, as the functions of the brain or the body in, in robotics as we define them or, or as we, we think of them for um, kind of engineering and optimization. Um, but I, I would certainly think it has to live in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, yeah. So um, coming back to redundancy or resilience, and I think that's something also yeah, it would be curious if many students would be curious to know more about that. But the scenario of maybe damages happening to either the brain or the body, how they can adapt to each other? Or maybe do you think in a certain situation could be a failure for the system if there is damage happening in all parts? Do you consider it's failure or no life to live? I don't know what, how you could see it uh, from your source and also research experience. Yeah, the, the question of robustness to changes or damage in the brain and the body um, I, I think to me are, are really interesting um, not just 
because it shows the the kind of generalizability and and resilience and robustness of these individual systems, which I, I think for uh, autonomous behavior and the types of things that, that we hope robots can do is, is extremely important because, you know, you, you never know what you're going to be faced with in open-ended, unstructured environments and, and being able to generalize both your thinking and, and your physical interactions with the world to, to things that you've never seen before is, is very important. Um, but, but the other reason I, I think that this is, is such an interesting question is how it dovetails um, with, with the creation of these things and, and optimization, that, that coming back to the idea of you know, uh, learning and, and development at, at multiple timescales, that uh, what we are, are seeing in terms of what the brain and the body look like uh, are, are constantly under flux and, and uh, changing over time. And so having each of these systems be... Uh, resilient to just totally natural and, and not uh, deleterious changes to the other system that you know you you have a brain that can still control your body as you grow um, throughout throughout your lifetime just seems like a like such a fundamentally important part of making uh, making adaptable systems that, that can adapt to uh, both natural and, and undesirable changes yeah so coming back to intelligence, because you really say that how we can design machine to learn and so on. Now, when it comes to see that how we can have this kind of generic and continual learning, if, assuming that we have robots that could grow, so for robots that grow. And I don't know if you can, how you can see current intelligence in soft robotics either. So if we speak about from the body itself or the brain itself in each scenario and what could you think be missing if we want to now to ing integrate living system in artificial one how they can autonomously grow and continue continue to learn how do you see that this integration from the body itself to the brain to that to this living this non-living creature uh, or system for example yeah um so the, there's this is kind of what one of the core questions of of my lab's research so i i, I could talk for, for great length at this, but uh, to maybe uh, try and be concise in, in, in just a, a few topics um, that, that I think, um, I think continual learning is, is kind of part of, of this uh, general adaptive behavior and, and especially the idea of generalization that, that you know, in, in kind of traditional machine learning, we think a lot about generalization behavior. We, we you know hardly ever think about uh, about uh, designing a, a system on a particular task and then seeing how well it does at that task. The, the interesting thing is always how it generalizes to, to new things it, it hasn't seen before. And, and in, in robotics, and, and I'm certainly guilty of this myself, I, I feel like often we you know have a, a particular task or environment in mind and we design something, a controller or a robot that's that's well suited to that task and and uh, hopefully usually it, it, it does well there um, but but that, that leaves so much open to how how adaptable it is to to totally new environments um, so the the continual learning perspective is is one that I, I, I really appreciate there um, and and it's certainly challenging um, that that uh, the traditional machine learning systems and, and robotics as well are are really meant to be specialized systems um, and, and is one of the ways in which they one of the many many ways in which they differ from kind of how you and I are, are designed and, and interact with our environments um, and and so yeah th thinking about that is is uh, ex extremely um, is, is an it, it, I, I think an extremely interesting problem to work on what could be challenging or maybe technological roadblocks that we can achieve this kind of learning that have this generalization and also continual learning. So what, where, where do you think this kind of the be that is hard for you to, to deploy when it comes to robotics? Yeah. 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 So there's, there's two parts of, of the continual learning that, that I, I think are really tricky. And, and one is being able to, uh, to see new tasks and environments and to uh, adapt to them. Um, and, and so, you know, being in incredibly plastic um, in, in how you're able to change over time is, is crucial to this. Uh, but the, the flip side of that coin is that um, 
when you think about continual learning and instead of kind of the, the, looking at the next task, this forward transfer, we, we also think about backwards transfer, which is saying, um, how, how does the, the new thing that you've adapted into also fare on, on the things that you've seen before? And, and so in that case, it's, uh, it's the case where being very plastic um, ter turns out to be, to be quite bad, that, that if you want to be good at the things you've seen before, the, the way to do it is to, to not change and keep doing the things that were successful before. Um, and so, so finding this, this middle ground between the, the two systems and, or between these kind of uh, the, these two competing objectives is, is something that's, that's really tricky. And there's lots of, um, lots of attention right now to this problem in, in machine learning um, and, and some kind of really excellent approaches um, are around trying to uh, have memories of, of prior tasks that, that let you still, you know, pretend you're in those environments um, or, or ways to limit the, the, the way that you learn new tasks so that they're, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're limiting the amount of plasticity that, that you have at any given time. Um, and the, the, the approach that, that my lab happens to take is, is uh, more related to the second one where we, we try and think about this on multiple timescales and at multiple um, levels of abstraction and, and think that um, you know, there, there must be kind of low level things about each task or environment or situation that, that you need to adapt to. And, and there must be some higher level mechanism which is modulating how and where and when and why you, you adapt to, to each of the, the new tasks. And, and you know, we, we can think about these from, uh, again, you know, evolutionary developmental and, and learning perspectives where um, you, you might have some higher order uh, regulatory system in your brain that, that, uh, that, that says, you know, just how um, you, you adapt to any given task that, that you might do at a, at a lower level time scale, at a, at a more immediate um, scale. Um, and, and thinking about the interactions of, of those two as, as you know, kind of a, a, a teacher and a student or a, a, a regulator and a learner um, has, has been a, a really interesting uh, approach for, for us for uh, exploring these questions. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe a quick question. Do you think based on, I don't know if you agree with that, do you think we have to design soft robotics or robotics in general, less depending on the feedback and more predictive uh, to predict this uncertainty? Do you, do you think that's something we have to consider to be less depending on the feedback? Yeah, so, so in thinking about uh, adaptability uh, and, and generalizability as really important facets of the, the type of systems that do well here, I, I think that having a lot of sensory feedback is maybe one of the most important things we can do. That if, if we can uh, develop systems that, you know, uh, just like closed loop control is better than open loop control, that, that don't kind of have a, uh, a fixed uh, blueprint or, or strategy, but have one that's adaptive to, to whatever's around them. Um, I, I think that that just naturally leads to better generalizability and and uh, and adaptability to, to new contexts, and, and I think that you know we, we can and should apply these um, not just to control um, where where the ideas of open loop and closed loop are are very um, very traditional and accepted, but but to how we think about the structures as well as well that, that we have um, these developmental processes that are heavily influenced by. The, the interactions or the you know stress and strain on any of your joints and, and bones and muscles um, at any given time that drastically affect the way that, that you grow and, and what you end up looking like. Um, and, and so I, I think that, uh, that absolutely this idea is really crucial and, and should be applied much more widely than it is perhaps. Maybe related here to morphological communication, because we ask sometimes, is, is it part of embodied intelligence when we see how the body's is, is morphology and the shape? And also, for example, from in soft robotics, we feel we speak about how we can use this geometric and, and coupling the geometric and material nonlinearities to get this intrinsic features of functional, like the control displacement or whatever you try to design. For you, when you look at some morphological computation, uh, do you think the material we have when you try to yeah to yeah work? Do you think the material has limitation 
when it comes to, uh, because we know sometimes if we have issue about the sensor design, how this is kind of material do you think would be optimal for you? And uh, it has to be have certain features or certain, yeah, wish list parameters. I don't know what you think about the material side here and so robotics, yeah. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, and and I I'll defer most of the the knowledge here to to my colleagues who have expertise in in material science and and engineering, um, and and I'll kind of just preface this by saying that uh, as someone who thinks about this as an optimization problem, um, and and has the luxury of uh, most often not being not uh, needing to go out and, and design and build these things my, myself, but but work with fantastic people who do. Um, I, I think I'm I think I'm more interested in uh, how some system will come to 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 learn and grow and, and develop over time, um, regardless of, of what uh, substrate that's built off of. Um, and, and certainly the, the outcomes will be very different depending on what materials you're, you're able to, to use for your particular soft robot. Um, but I, I think that the, the questions uh, r remain somewhat agnostic to, to what, what substrate you, you build it on. That, that said, um, I think that the optimal thing um, in, in terms of, uh, of, of being adaptable and and being able to do complex uh, behaviors is some material that's you know not only soft, um, but is is able to change its its stiffness in real time. Uh, a material that's that's able to uh, have some sort of sensory um, apparatus, whether that's proprioceptive or whether that's uh, you know touch sensation or, or anything else. Um, and and also is is you know easily uh, actuatable, um, you know, and, and how much it can move and and the the physical energy requirements that that are required to do so because that's also a, a constraint we face all the time in soft robotics too. I'm curious, Askunik, when you look at the field, do you think maybe there's maybe or direction? Uh, you think we have to give more more attention or more focus in the field? when you have this kind of look to the field in general, we have to be give much attention yeah. Yeah, to a certain direction. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, to, to ask what the most important direction is um, and, and what deserves attention, everyone will uh, and, and should say kind of their own work and their own interests. And, and I don't mean that in a, an egotistical or cynical way, but in a very optimistic one, which is that there's there's so many open and interesting problems, and if you yourself are not working on the problem that you think is the most vital and most interesting and important, you should change your topic and, and work on the thing that, that you think is most important. Um, so, so yeah, per personally, I'm I'm extremely interested in in the the design tools um, and. Um, and and this, again, especially the relationship between structure and function for for designing the, these robots that we've made uh, enormous leaps in in the the materials that we have and and in especially the complexity at which we can build robots that additive manufacturing the last five or ten years has has been a, an absolutely phenomenal breakthrough um, and, and we can print things with almost arbitrary complexity and scale and, and detail. Um, and, and yet the, the tools that we have to take advantage of that uh, shape complexity um, and, and create really intricate and well-adapted forms uh, is, is certainly lacking. And the, the ability that we have to control those forms um, and, and especially make forms that are easily controllable um, I, I think is is an area where we could see lots of uh, of impactful uh, innovation, um, and and so I I think that uh, I think that that from a a practical perspective, that's where where I'm most interested and excited, um, and and from a slightly more theoretical perspective, I, I think that one of the things we we Kind of overlook, um, and, and again, this comes back to to the idea that in, in robotics we kind of so often look at specific demonstrations, um, which which are 
are, are, are themselves amazing, but it's it sometimes makes it hard to, to take a step back and look at the, the broader picture. Um, and, and I think that a lot of the way that we uh, talk about uh, morphological computation and, and embodied cognition are, uh, are, are tend to be just because of the, the nature of how hard they are to describe, um, kind of very anecdotal and, and look at specific examples and say, well, obviously there's morphological computation here, or, or obviously there's, there's embodied cognition playing a role in, in the system. And, and I, I think that we're, uh, I, I would love to see kind of a, a more overarching theory of, of, you know, what exactly that is and, and how we define it, but especially how we measure it. Um, that, that this is something I uh, was, was really interested in, in in grad school before getting sidetracked with, with so many of the challenges that, that, step, that, that, that came up. Um, as, as stepping stones towards this problem, but the, the idea of being able to really objectively and in, in, in a general way measure morphological computation, I, I think would be uh, really impactful for, for soft robotics and, and kind of especially selfishly perhaps for, for me as someone working in optimization that uh, you know, we can improve and optimize the things that we can measure well. And it's we, we can you know measure performance or locomotion speed or you know navigation really well or, or how well you can pick something up re really well, um, but uh, but to to be able to optimize towards more abstract things like morphologies that, that enable more morphological computation I, I think would be uh, really really game changing in, in how we think about design. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah. But I guess that's key also about simulation to reality, because you, I think, maybe even a student's curious to know from you, what's actually you think fill the gap when it comes to the material? It's hard sometimes to simulate viscoelastic material or capture the nonlinearities in the material. So what do you think maybe we have to do that we can r reduce this gap? Or what do you think from your, your experiences uh, we can do? Yeah, th this is absolutely a, um a, a really critical and important problem, and um, yeah, l l like you said, it's it's an area where I uh, have have dabbled, um, but but really defer to others who uh, who who've spent more time working on this problem. Um, but but uh, there's there there's kind of two two approaches, at least in my mind, and and one is to kind of work on getting all of the details as precise as we can in, in our simulation so that um, the, we're, we're narrowing the gap uh, b between simulation and reality. Um, and, and that is, is just such a, a hard thing to do to you know, capture every, um, every single facet about what makes reality so complex that, that that's, I, I think, kind of gone out of fashion. Um, and um, and and maybe the uh, the the more scalable and, and I think a more popular approach is is to to think about creating systems that are just more robust and, and more adaptable and more generalizable, so that when there's this gap that we know exists, um, we can think about uh, having systems which. Um, which uh, can can uh, acknowledge there's a gap and, and still cross it, um, and so th this could be in uh, constraining the, the system that you know if we think about the the types of gates that that we might expect a, a robot to have that you know you can do do tricks like uh, re reduce the the time scales so that none of the dynamic gates are available and, and you can only do static gates which tend to transfer better um, but I, I think that uh, that thinking about this again from a, a kind of more machine learning perspective thinking about uh, about generalization and, and especially kind of diversity of, of the, the training experiences which you give a, a system or a robot um, that uh, you know people people have thought about for a long time you know introducing noise into physics simulators and, and running lot, lots of trials or you know looking at evaluating systems in multiple simulators at once acknowledging that each one is probably biased in a different way and, and I think that sort of kind of that, that focus on generalization 
um, we, we can you know take way beyond there in, in the ways that we develop um, brains and bodies that are good for continual learning that, that I, I hope we'll push forward on much more. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Sounds so close to the end. I have a few questions. The first one, I, I don't know for, from your research experience, do you have any situation scenario, um, sort of the empirical work, uh, you get the result was really counterintuitive or surprising, you didn't expect it. And maybe in modeling or, or simulation, you have something something else different. Do you have anyone like that? <laughs> that that, that uh, is is almost an everyday occurrence in science where, and, and, and to be, to be honest, that's the kind of the, the best parts of science is, is where, you know, what, what you get is, is surprising and, and unintuitive. Um, and, and at the, the most basic level, um, working in, in machine learning where we're just kind of uh, setting up the, the, the playground for these, these optimizers to come in and design robots that look certain ways or behave certain ways. Um, it, it's, it's just kind of ripe for, for that su sort of surprise. And, and I remember, um, you know, when, when first building some of the, the soft robotic frameworks that, that I, I worked on in grad school, um, you know, just, uh, just coming back the, the next morning after running these experiments overnight to just see what sort of robot forms or behaviors um, would would be present the, the next day it, it's itself was was really fun and, and interesting um, in, in, in terms of of uh, the the science uh, and, and surprises kind of at a, at a more abstract scale um, like, like I mentioned in, in grad school um, one of the things that, that I'd hoped to do was to uh, you know find better ways to, to quantify morphological computation um, and and thought well I, I have some ideas let's go uh, design a bunch of robots with complex controllers and, and complex morphologies and and we can test these out and and, and try and, and come up with some of these measurements um, and and kind of much to to my surprise and, and, and chagrin uh, it it turned out that none of my runs would would would, would do anything that, that none of these robots could um, could could come up with with any forms that looked complex at all, or or, or behaviors that looked complex at all, and and I was uh, kind of especially discouraged since you know earlier on I I as I just mentioned found all of these robots with all these really interesting and complex behaviors, um, and and that was the case when when I had really complex forms but but really kind of naive simple controllers and and that was you know purposeful at the time to try and show just how much complex behavior you could get from embodied cognition and and I, I kind of knew that the converse was true in in more traditional robotics and, and even kind of older evolutionary robotics that that we could have really complex controllers with these simple rigid prototype robots um, but it, I, I was really surprised that that the intersection of the two that when we had kind of both robots and controllers that that had really open-ended uh, possibilities and, and thousands of parameters each that uh, the, the system just totally broke N nothing nothing would happen um, and, and and after being discouraged by this quite a bit uh, it turned out actually to be a, a, a phenomenal blessing in disguise in that you know, it, it focused my attention on, on trying to figure out why it is that controllers and, and morphologies uh, affect each other and how we can design optimization tools that, that account for this and, and let us uh, uh, do open-ended optimization when we have complexity on both fronts. So, so that's become a major part of, of my research, kind of both within soft robotics and, and even more broadly in, in machine learning. Um, and and I, I don't think I would get there at all if I, I hadn't had these struggles. Um, with uh, the, the original game plan I had during grad school. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, yeah. Um, also, I ask you, for students maybe curious about what you mentioned, do you think other tools we, we need to focus on, like modeling, I don't know, um, what could be other tools do you think we have to get also focus on, or maybe, yeah, for students to focus more so that they can be confident in this field? Uh, do you think modeling, or what could be else? Yeah, it, 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 it really depends a lot on what your interests are, what, what your particular project is, or, or even kind of the focus of, of your lab. Um, and, 
it's it certainly helps to to be curious and, and interested and in always picking up new new skills and, and exploring new tools uh but the the kind of the best advice i can give um it for for new students especially but just for kind of how we carry out science is is just to be at, at places that that uh, have people from a lot of different backgrounds um and and yourself be really open and, and curious to uh, to ideas and tools outside of your field um and and so often uh i it, you know especially in grad school and and, and here in, in my own lab as well you know uh try to do something or understand some process and uh, you wouldn't have been able to figure it out if I didn't have someone who was working on material science at the desk next to me or a really great machine learning pro person sitting across from me. And um, that, that uh, rather than kind of having a, a, a focus on all of the, the different aspects that you could possibly have, which is it's just impossible to, to cover all your bases, just to, to know people uh, who, who are experts in each of the camps. I don't know if you have any crazy ideas when you have this kind of all this talent and you try to get this inspiration. I don't know if you have any crazy idea when you think like I need this to the robot to robot be in a certain morphology. I don't know, maybe I don't know what kind of crazy ideas do you have. Yeah, I I uh, so sometimes take inspiration from from biology for for specific ideas of of what the robot should do and and sometimes take inspiration for applications of, you know, what's what's the most impactful thing um, that, that, that we, we could be doing with these systems. One, one of my uh, favorite uh, kind of crossovers of, of those two was um, kind of a, a after developing uh, the this, this soft robotic framework that, that I had um, and, and, and uh, looking at examples of biological complexity in in, in uh, nature, especially kind of it, the the high embodied intelligence, high morphological computation, things like uh, an octopus, um, I ended up writing a, a paper kind of just just for fun that was uh, a soft robot um, that that uh, you know initially at the beginning of its optimization was this solid cube inside of a, a box with little holes in it. Um, that was inspired by watching uh, an octopus squeeze through these little holes within a, a, a cage um, and and asking the the system to try and figure out how to find the best structure that was most able to fold and contort itself to to, to get out of it um, I, I'm not sure that's uh, kind of like the, the the grand vision killer app of uh, soft robotics, but but was a, a a fun example for for me who uh, maybe doesn't do a, a lot of these um, kind of specific applied projects um, in, in in this space to to just build a, a simulation of of one that, that I found interesting and kind of had a proof of concept for in, in nature and and just to see what happened and. Uh, Luckily, it had ended up uh, working out that the, the the soft robot did did indeed find a way out. Um, if 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 I were to to think of kind of where where my crazy ideas are, it's it's less so about a, a particular uh, shape or design of, of robot, but again, is more at the scale of of optimization and um, and, and thinking about. Um, how how these systems come to be and, and how it is that that their structure and function inform each other and and so the the, the things that i'm uh kind of most excited about now are are even taking a step back and asking how those those questions and and all of the the tools i've built and lessons i've learned in in soft robotics can also uh show insights in in other areas too that you know, I, I think that embodied intelligence is something that uh, I, I'm not quite sure I'd say we're, we're mainstream yet, but has, has gained so much traction in, in soft robotics and, and even in, in, in robotics more generally. Um, 
but that uh, you know almost none of the ideas we think of uh, would would be uh, tools that a typical machine learning person would use when they're looking at designing a controller for some neural network architecture. And and yet you know the, the analogy there is is almost uh, too literal to be ignored. Um, and and so yeah, trying to think about kind of uh, broader theories uh, across these fields is is something that I uh, is, is is really challenging, but but something that that excites me right now. So the last question of this one, what could be the most important quality uh, you have gained or have been in your career? One important quality you have to maintain. Uh, yeah, uh, I've, I've talked about curiosity a lot and, and I, I totally think that, that, that that's one of them. Um, if, uh, if, if I would say one that, that maybe is, is most important outside of that would just be perseverance that, uh, you know, in, in academia, so often we are uh, compared against and, and competing with other just phenomenally intelligent and hardworking people. Um, and, and even, you know, really excellent works and really excellent people get rejected more often than not. And um, my, uh, my, my advisor uh, in, in grad school, Hod Libson, uh, would, would say, you know, just, just think of it as, as a pipe. Um, and, and you're just kind of pushing in all of the great stuff that you can and, and don't worry so much about what comes out the other side because eventually you'll, you'll make it through and come out the other side. But, but think about what's going into it. Um, and and uh, I, from, from kind of having a, a background in, in athletics too, I, I think about this a lot as, um, as, as not, uh, you know, re kind of results-based thinking, but... Um, but but just uh, a, an emphasis on you know showing up every day and 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 uh, working and and trying to improve and, and get better every day, which is, is such a, a, a cliche in, in the sports world of you know we're we're just trying to, to put in the, the, the work and, and get better today. Uh, but I, I think that that kind of internal locus of control and that that internal thinking is is really important in academia too, where it's it's just such tough going sometimes. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Maybe I don't know if you think about because we speak sometimes with the podcast was publish or perish sometimes if because if you have, yeah, we know there is a, a pressure to publish and when you are curious and sometimes this problem takes a lot of time. Maybe I don't know. It depends, of course, but. Do you think it's affecting you uh, that you are curious and you have this yeah this grunt challenge as uh, maybe yeah sometimes you can do incremental work but if you really passionate so passionate you sometimes take a lot of time to come up with a solution I don't know if that affecting you or it's not really affecting you as a researcher yeah that's that's, that's something I think all of us face um, and and it's it's not only the case that that these works. Um, that, that are perhaps um, you know more more innovative or, or at least more different um, take more time to, to come about but they're also I think um, much more likely to to not be easily uh, it, it, you know accepted or or to be well reviewed by uh, uh, your your peers in, in a peer review process just because they're Kind of by definition more more out of the box and, and less familiar it's, it's hard to evaluate those things um just just because they're they're different and they're and they're more risky so i, I think kind of on, on both of those fronts the 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 amount of time and effort that you put in and maybe the the amount of perseverance that you need to to push that through the the finish line as well is is, is really tough um and yeah as as, as much as i um, like to be a, a, a internally focused person, it's it's certainly always hard to not uh, think about the, the the metrics and and awards and papers and, and all the things that, uh, that that you hope for for external validation. Um, so I, I certainly you know fall fall to those traps as well. Um, but uh, I I uh, feel uh, very lucky to be surrounded by phenomenal people and and um, i'm confident that we're going to do great work and and you know have a, a a long lasting lab and it's also kind of nice that i'm you know not not at a a harvard or an mit or a stanford where uh the the tenure rates are so uh so um 
kind of embarrassingly low that that that's a, a real stressor is is job security and I've I've you know been in those positions kind of research scientist positions where where that has been an issue and and feel you know really fortunate to be a tenure track at a place where tenure track faculty tend to be successful. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And lastly, maybe what could be the best advice you mentioned hold lots of advice, but I don't know if you have any advice. Do you think was maybe life changing or maybe stick to your mind? Um, yeah, yeah. Certainly, all of that is is fantastic advice. Um, um, yeah, uh, for for new scientists, um, you know, outside of those qualities, I would say advice for for doing good science um, is. Uh, it's, it's something I, I feel like I, I continually learn from from uh, a longtime collaborator here in Vermont and, and, and good very good friend Josh Bongard that uh, that good science doesn't have to be complicated that that it's often more challenging and and more impactful to take some complex uh, phenomenon or problem and and distill it into its simplest, uh, most basic form and, and ask questions about it there um, and, and that in finding a simple question and, and answering a simple question is is very uh, very often a, a really hard thing to do but kind of the, the most important thing you can do in science is to, uh, to to really find out what's at the core of your question and, and go after that and, and not be distracted by uh, by all the other complexity in the problem Wonderful. thanks thanks so much Nick um, I don't know if you have any final words you would like to say. Uh, do you have any final words you would like to say before we close? Uh? Um, no, this this has been uh, fantastic. Thank, thanks for taking the time today, and 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 thanks for 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 doing this podcast as well. It's uh, certainly been um, isolating and, and stressful times during the pandemic, and and having found this podcast uh, recently, it's it's been really nice to be able to to hear the voices of a lot of friends and colleagues who I. Uh, haven't had the chance to go out and talk with the conferences lately. So that's that's been really fun for me personally. Thanks so much, Nick. I do appreciate your time. And you are very inspiring and also very intelligent researcher. I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. Thanks.